Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, France. A blazing row erupted this week in Europe's second biggest economy. French President Francois Hollande was forced to purge his cabinet of rebel ministers because they disagreed with his economics. His popularity is now at an all-time low and France could be falling into recession. We'll investigate whether France is on the brink. Also this week, we'll be taking a look at the drugs industry and Ebola. The outbreak of the deadly and highly infectious disease in Africa has already claimed over 1,500 lives, and health officials are warning that the worst is yet to come. So why is there still no approved treatment for the Ebola virus, and why is Big Pharma not interested? Also, Indonesia's sugar addiction, the world's fourth most populous country, has become the world's largest importer of sugar. Once the largest exporter, local sugar mills can't keep up with demand. But Indonesians' sweet tooth is costing the country dearly. France announced a new cabinet this week following the surprise resignation of the government. Monday's walkout was the climax of a bitter dispute over economic policy. Al Jazeera's Jonah Hull has all the details. The shock cabinet reshuffle has been described in the French press as the last chance for President Francois Hollande to save his five-year term. Prime Minister Manuel Valls' new government lineup excludes rebellious former ministers who openly denounced the government's austerity-led policies. There can be debate within the government, and we discuss every matter. But outside the government, we could not accept some ministers questioning the direction, the economic policy defined by the head of state. That may silence dissent, but do little to improve the image of France's most unpopular president in 50 years. When you're given responsibilities, if you see that you're not up to the task, you need to drop your ego and leave and let someone competent take your place. Almost halfway through his term, France has fallen out of love with Francois Hollande. A recent poll suggested that no more than 15% of French people have any faith in Hollande to fix France's problems. The owner of this third-generation family firm isn't one of them. We need to do something to increase people's purchasing power. I'm a small business owner and for now I'm barely getting by. Taxes go up each year, that's true, but the main issue is low revenue, fewer customers buying less. Current economic policy isn't focused on putting more money in the pockets of consumers. Revenue here isn't likely to go up, and nor are President Hollande's popularity figures. Well, the danger is the French economy could now be on the brink of becoming the latest sick man of Europe. Unemployment is higher than at any time since the late 1990s and hasn't fallen below 7% in nearly 30 years. And that's creating chronic joblessness in the crime-ridden banlieues of France's big urban areas. France hasn't balanced its books since 1974 and public debt stands at over 90% of GDP and rising. And statistics released this week revealed that French manufacturing confidence fell to the lowest in 13 months in August. So, after a stagnant first half, there's now a real danger that France could fall into another recession before the year is out. Well, amid the political turmoil on Thursday, Hollande appealed for a greater focus on growth in Europe. Yeah. I will propose a Eurozone summit as soon as possible. It is in the interest of Europe because its place in the world economy is in question. Well, joining us now from London is Jonathan Fenby, author of France on the Brink. Jonathan, thanks for being with us on Counting the Cost. To what extent are France's current economic woes the fault of President Hollande? Uh, as you put it in a recent FT article, France has put off its day of reckoning for so long, so its economy would be struggling regardless of who's in power right now, wouldn't it? 
Yes, that is certainly true. Um, the needed reforms, structural reforms, reforms to make France more competitive, have been put off by successive governments of the right and the left uh, for about half a century now. Uh, France has had politicians like Nicolas Sarkozy, the previous president, who came to office um, vowing to shake things up and make reforms and then quickly went into a kind of protective huddle and uh, did very little uh, in the end. Hollande made things worse by coming to power a couple of years ago and uh, taking measures which were designed to reflate the economy, to get out of the recession and depression which, China, uh, which uh, France has uh, suffered from, but which uh, had the effect, particularly through high taxation, of actually damping down activity, uh, lessening uh, household consumption and producing growth, which its forecast will be below 1% this year, along with very high unemployment. Is there anything in the President's uh background, his experience before coming to power that is perhaps exacerbating uh, France's economic woes? Yes, I think that is the case. I mean, Hollande, in a sense, is the accidental, accidental president because uh, at the last presidential election in 2012, Sarkozy was so unpopular that any uh, opposition candidate who didn't make uh, terrible mistakes was practically bound to be elected. And, of course, the former finance minister and head of the IMF, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, was the socialist uh, candidate for that. Uh, but then uh, he had his imbroglio in a uh, hotel room uh, with a maid uh, in Manhattan and that knocked him out of it and Hollande became uh, the candidate there. His background is that of a backroom operator, a manager in the Socialist Party dating back to the early 80s and his concern has always been very much to hold the Socialist Party together and that means uh, avoid taking rather old-fashioned left-wing uh, economic policies and not taking any risks. Plus the fact that <coughs> on a television interview back in 2012, he said straightforwardly, I don't like rich people. Uh, so there's, there's a background there, certainly. There's a good deal of, of Germany bashing going on in French politics right now. Indeed, it was the, it was the catalyst for last weekend's purge of, of anti-austerity left-wingers from the government. Are Germany and Bundesbank influence over over the ECB merely a scapegoat for France's current economic problems. They are in part a scapegoat. It's very easy to blame foreigners, of course, rather than getting to grips with your own uh, internal uh, problems. Uh, but there is certainly a, a difference of policy analysis between Paris and Berlin, with Berlin with a strong economy, although it is weakening now to some extent, insisting on austerity, and France always having uh, had liked the idea of reflation, of pumping money into the economy, of bashing the rich um, and of taking uh, that kind of approach, which has applied uh, under some right-wing governments uh, as well as left-wing governments. But I think there is a deeper, almost existential issue here, which is that if you think back to the late 1950s, the founding of the Fifth Republic, which still rules in France uh, by Charles de Gaulle, the, very much the deal in Europe at that point was that France took the political leadership of the European community while Germany supplied the economic motor. And Germany went along with that at the time. But increasingly, Chancellor Merkel is taking a political uh, role. Indeed, some people think she's not taking a sufficiently strong international political uh, position. And that leaves France a bit trailing, you know, uh, behind. I mean, if you take, for instance, a country like China, when it wants to do business in Europe, it doesn't go to Brussels, it certainly doesn't go to Paris, it goes to Berlin uh, to uh, get things done there. And that is something that the French find pretty difficult uh, to accept. So you've got, as you say, the German bashing on the left of the Socialist Party by uh, Montbourg, the economics minister who was forced out at the weekend. But that goes right across the political spectrum to the far-right National Front, which is very uh, anti-German as well 
well as being very anti-euro. So you've got quite a dangerous um, cocktail here uh, in France of this anti-austerity uh, uh, program uh, among uh, quite a wide range of politicians, the anti-German feeling, the lure of protectionism, which is there, and I think underlying it all, and this is uh, the, the argument uh, in my new book on France, the feeling that somehow France is no longer playing the role which its people still think uh, it is due to uh, and should be playing. And um, this is a kind of you know national identity crisis yeah. which you're going through and which is shown in the latest events. So, I, w I wanted to ask you what what dangers France's current political and economic malaise pose to to the to the European project. The danger which I think Hollande will not fall for because he made his decision very clearly uh, at the weekend. Uh, not to, get, to go for this, but the danger is that uh, nationalism may rise in France, particularly at the next presidential election in 2017, and particularly if Hollande, who's very weak in the polls, below 20%, if he runs again, and then you could get a pretty chaotic uh, political situation based on the economic woes of France with the National Front. I mean, the National Front leader, Marine Le Pen, now outpolls uh, the president, Hollande, uh, in the opinion surveys. Um, maybe the mainstream right, which is divided, will get itself together. You've got a hard left party, separate from the Socialist Party, and now you'll have a rebel faction within the Socialist Party as a result of the purge of the weekend. So this is a pretty uh, volatile and explosive political uh, situation we're going to have in France. And, and I, that will have its effect on Europe. Jonathan, I've learned a lot. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Great to talk to you. Great pleasure. Thank you. And still ahead on this week's Counting the Cost, a mysterious threat to the olive groves of southern Italy. Italy is the world's second largest exporter of olive oil after Spain. Find out why industry watchers are worried. A leading American health official warned this week that the Ebola outbreak in West Africa will only get worse. More than one and a half thousand people have died in four affected West African nations since the start of this year. Erica Wood reports. Now more than ever, doctors, disease experts, aid groups the world over have stark warnings about Ebola. It's no longer just Africa's problem. The world has never seen an outbreak of Ebola like this. I wish I didn't have to say this, but it is going to get worse before it gets better. The World Health Organization now says it needs $490 million to help combat what is the world's worst outbreak of the virus. And it'll be some time before they'll be able to fully control its spread. At the moment, our, uh, our leaders say that they would estimate six to nine months uh, before this outbreak can be contained, and you really want to feel that there are, you really want to see no more cases of Ebola. That's when you know it's contained. Um, so it's a, long, it's a long haul still. It's a long distance to go still, unfortunately. This strain of Ebola is killing more than half of those who are infected. It's spread through contact with bodily fluids. And although there are controversial treatments now being trialled, there are no known cures. The major battle has been properly educating the public and fighting the fear inside the affected countries. The healthcare system ha has more or less broken down. Hospitals are closed, uh, clinics uh, are closed, some of them have reopened, uh, but the staff is afraid to go back because they, uh, they're afraid to get the disease. But health workers already trying to help treat and contain the outbreak are understaffed and under-resourced. And the spread isn't slowing down, more than 40% of all those infected contracted the virus in the past three weeks alone. They simply cannot keep up. The numbers is going up rapidly, faster than what we thought, uh, forcing us to adapt our plans and our strategy on a daily basis. Uh, it is really an extremely challenging situation for, for everyone. And MSF, we, we, we can't do more than we're doing now. The WHO is now helping 11 countries get ready for a possible spread of Ebola inside their borders, mostly neighbouring countries, by offering training and protective clothing. But the message from experts and leaders has been clear. The response needs to come not just from Africa, but the world over. Well, along with the medical emergency, the impact of the outbreak on business in the region is increasingly being felt. Most of the affected countries and their neighbours have closed borders to stop the virus spreading. This has killed off what was vibrant trade in commodities like palm oil. 
In the last two days, both Air France and British Airways have suspended flights to the region. It's a move that the UN says makes it harder to tackle the virus and hurts the economies. Sierra Leone had hoped to export some $200 million worth of diamonds this year, but the government says that the outbreak will prevent it from meeting that target, with miners too afraid to go to diamond pits in the country's east, where there have been cases. This week, the African Development Bank donated $60 million towards essential supplies to help train medical workers. But it says the outbreak could cost the affected countries up to 4% of their gross domestic product, a massive hit for already very poor countries. Markets are not functioning. Airlines are not coming in. Projects have been cancelled. Business people have, have left. That is very, very damaging. Well, joining us now, David Heyman, who's Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Professor, welcome to Counting the Cost. Uh, there's no, vi uh, no vaccine for Ebola at present. Uh, treatment drugs are at an experimental stage. Uh, what does it take to get the pharmaceutical industry geared up to fight this disease? The research and development that's been done to present has been done with funding from the U.S. government to the private sector to do research and development on this and many other agents that the U.S. government is concerned about. Uh, these products are now in early testing in, in animal models, and they some of them are actually shown to be effective, and some of them, in fact, the monoclonal antibody that treats infection has been used in some patients. So there are lots of drugs being developed. The problem, of course, will be how to get them to countries where there is an epidemic. And that's, that certainly must be worked on now, especially after this outbreak is over. Is Big Pharma interested in this fight? Is, does Ebola uh, pose a global threat? Is, is it a threat to people outside of, of West Africa? Well, Ebola is a threat to Africa, clearly, and it, it, it's a very terrible disease has on two occasions traveled into industrialized countries, once into South Africa and once into Switzerland. In both instances, there was excellent hospital infection control, and in neither hospitals was there any more transmission, except for one nurse who saw the patient in South Africa before hospitalization. So Ebola is not a threat to industrialized countries. It may come into country from time to time, but infection control procedures in hospitals are such that it won't spread. Now, if we were facing a flu, a flu pandemic, I could imagine Big Pharma I mean, scrambling to, to, to gear up to fight because there's potentially money, big profits in, in drugs to fight something like a, a flu pandemic. That's not the case with Ebola, though, is it? No, that's not the case. You know, flu is transmitted by respiratory infection from person to person through the air, whereas Ebola is not transmitted that way. So it's very difficult to transmit Ebola, really, except if you're in very close contact with a patient, either body secretions, blood, or some type of excreta. Aside from that, Ebola doesn't spread from human to human. All right, so where are we, we at as far as... Uh... Uh, the pharmaceutical fight against Ebola right now. As we said, there's no, there's no vaccine. There are experimental drugs. How do those experimental drugs work? What do they do? Well, vaccine will actually cause the body to develop antibody and prevent infection. So that would be ideal to have a vaccine. The drugs are of two different types. One is an antiviral drug, which kills the virus in the body, and Ebola is caused by a virus. And the other is a monoclonal antibody, which is a preparation to neutralize the virus if it's given to a patient who's sick. There is hope in Africa because they could be trying, and some countries may do this, trying convalescent sera, that is serum from patients who have had the infection and who have recovered, collecting their blood, collecting the antibody, and giving it to patients. This has been tried before in epidemics. And what is needed now is to try it again, but with closely controlled clinical trials, so the effectiveness can be seen, whether or not this is really effective. Does the nature of this disease make research and development of drugs particularly difficult? Yes, it's very difficult to study these in the laboratory because, as you know, it must be done in a maximum security laboratory. But that's not a deterrent to developing drugs and vaccines. The deterrent, of course, is the market. And what needs to be done is to attempt to figure how the market can pay for these drugs at the time of an epidemic. Are you 
satisfied that, that, that Ebola will remain a, a regional crisis to West Africa, that it can be contained within one area of the world? We don't know those questions yet. But for now, it remains limited to Africa, except for the Philippines, where there's a, a non-pathogenic Ebola that doesn't cause human illness, but does cause illness in animals. Professor, it's been really good to talk to you. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Thanks very much. Now, Indonesia is set to leapfrog China as the world's largest sugar importer. But Indonesian sweet tooth is already costing the country dearly with high rates of obesity and diabetes. Al Jazeera's Step Vasan reports from Yogyakarta. It's not a question if you want sugar with your tea, but do you want tea with your sugar? Indonesians are famous for having a sweet tooth. Around 20 kilograms of sugar are consumed per person per year, more than in most other Asian countries. The result is a huge increase of obesity in Indonesia, where at the same time malnutrition is still prevalent. More than 12 percent of the children are now overweight. Organizations like the Big Community are asking the government to create awareness. Uh, what is needed is education, that sugar isn't good for you and that a toddler who is fat isn't healthy, as many here think. Due to the enormous demand for sugar, Indonesia has become the world's largest importer. Once the largest exporter, local sugar mills can't keep up with demand. It's a livelihood to many here, but some call this white poison. Too much sugar does more harm to your body than simply ruin your teeth. But many Indonesians are not aware of the implications, health experts fear the worst. Some are talking about a time bomb, looking at rapid urbanization, changing lifestyles and smart food advertisements for children. We know that already non-communicable diseases are increasing at a very rapid rate. Diabetes, for example, it, the prevalence has doubled in three years and increase in hypertension and so forth. This is going to consume um, a huge amount of the budget of the health system and, and draw it away from other needed areas of the health system, for example, in preventing and treating childhood diseases. So we're extremely concerned. While the government says it has started awareness campaigns, there's still no legislation for food labeling. Sugar producers deny responsibility. If we work hard, we need energy. Even if we consume sweet drinks, but we work hard, our bodies will not get sick. We only get sick if we consume too much sugar without doing physical exercise. To prevent a health crisis, habits have to be changed quickly. And that means swapping sugar for a healthy alternative and getting more exercise. Finally, an insect-borne bacteria is taking a bite out of Italy's olive industry. The bacteria, which originated in the Americas, has infected almost one million trees, and experts warn there's no way of stopping it. Claudia Lavanga has our report from Gallipoli in the region of Apulia. For Cosimo De Luca, this is usually the time when a year of hard work bears fruit. He is one of thousands of olive growers in the southern Italian region of Apulia, the nation's biggest producer of quality olive oil. But this year, his business is suffering. It's a pandemic. Look around. All my trees are dead and nobody is doing anything about it. They abandoned us. This is what's killing Cosimo's trees, the Xylella fastidiosa, a bacterium common in the Americas but never seen before in Europe. It's difficult to know how the bacteria reached Italy, but it's clear how it spreads. This is the carrier of the bacteria. It's called the Midospital bug. It's a small cicada. It looks harmless, but it transfers the bacteria from tree to tree, which eventually kills them. So far, 800,000 trees were contaminated. That's 10% of the region's total. The cost to local olive oil producers, $300 million. Scientists are trying to contain the problem by cutting down infected trees, some 500 years old. But they say prevention is better than the cure. 
Eh, purtroppo è un batterio per il quale This bacteria has been known in the American continent for 150 years, but there is no cure or prevention for it. We can try to contain the disease, but in Europe there is no system of quarantine for plants coming from abroad. The disease has not yet influenced the quality or the price of olive oil from Apulia, but it's spreading fast, and farmers here say something has to be done soon to avoid this centuries-old tradition going dry. And that's our show for this week. Any comments? Feel free to tweet me at A Finnegan. Use the hashtag counting the cost or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net our address. That's where we end this edition though of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan in Doha from the whole team here. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next and I'll see you again.